Hello, hello. Oh my gosh, it's been so long. I have been away in Florida um, prepping for a due process case. And gosh, I'm excited to be back. It's been a while. I needed the vacation break, but really it was a lot of work. Um, but I'm excited to be back. So with that said, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Raven Woods, and I'm the CEO and founder of Autism Mama Rocks, the IEP, and I help parents gain the knowledge and the confidence to become the CEO of their IEP meeting. So with that said, if you're new to catching me live, post a one below, okay? If you're an oldie but goodie, you guys know who you are, post a two below. Make sure whatever it is that you do, <laughs> you just say hello. I like to get to know you guys. And if you haven't joined the group, it's a pretty awesome group. It's Autism Mama Rocks, the IEP group. You can stick it in the search bar and um, it will come right up. Um, I'd love to have you. So with that said, hi, Tina, how are you? Yes, you did. <laughs> hi, Jan, how are you? Um, the other thing I want to tell you guys is always click notifications so you know when I go live. And even if you can't catch me live, you at least know I went live and you can come back and watch it later. And yes, the answer is yes, you can share this as we speak. So whenever you wanna share it, go ahead and do that. Hi, Cynthia, how are ya? Okay, awesome. Okay, so as you guys know, all right, my, um, <laughs> I'm excited about this, okay? My services, accommodation, and modifications mini course is done. Okay, so I'm either gonna launch it Thursday or I may go ahead and just launch it on Monday or Tuesday, but I'm so excited about it. So everything you wanna know about services, accommodations, modifications, all the services that are out there that are not on the internet. Um, it's kind of crazy how you know we always do this Google thing and all the things that are actually out there and what really can pertain to your child and what actually can be a service or accommodation or a modification is not out there. It's almost like they don't want to broadcast it to you because they don't want you to know about it. Um, so I have that all in there. You got me live face to face <laughs> on a video and I'm teaching you everything from start to finish, um, including the laws with it. I talked to you all about OCR and how that pertains to all your services, accommodations and modifications. So I'm super excited about that. So with that said, today we're going to talk about the new IEP services for next year and what you actually need to be thinking about for next year. I know it's kind of crazy. We don't know if our kids are going to go back to school. We don't know, you know, if things are going to ever be the same, really, so to speak. But they are. They're going to get back to the same. Will you and should you get compensatory services Absolutely. And there's a way to do that. And if you've been following me, you'll know that there's a very simple way in which you can do that. Okay. And it's actually a very effective way because the ball's in your cart now, because it's interesting how we now are the data takers. <laughs> and so be so good at it that they need to know what to expect just by seeing your data, okay? So prove them wrong in the sense of you gotta have this data, all right? So show them what you wanna see, you know? Kind of like put it out there like a, see, this is what I want. It's really easy to do, but you actually have to do the work, right? So with that said, what I want you to think about for next year, I have my notes here with me, is these changes should be based on your child's needs, not what the school has or really what it is they want to say they can pro provide you for next year. Because unless it's about the impact of disability and what your child specifically needs, I don't want to hear about it. Okay, so make sure it's about what they need. All right. Um, you're not always going to get what you want in the first IEP meeting. You're not always going to get what you want in the second IEP meeting. And this is a hard thing, I guess, for me to talk about with clients because I'm a mom. I have a child on the spectrum and it's hard to hear that I'm not going to get it right now. And that can suck, you know, just to be very honest. And so you have to understand that sometimes that first IEP meeting where you're kind of digging that ditch a little bit, um, you have to understand that that is just one 
dig. <laughs> okay. You, you sometimes you need a couple to get to where you need to be. All right. Um, maybe that wasn't a good analogy. Whatever. But bottom line, sometimes you just kind of need to show up and show them what you got and then do it again. All right. And that's one thing I can say about anything really is if you didn't do it right the first time or it didn't go the way you wanted it to go the first time, don't give up, okay? Don't feel bad, don't get down. Literally, I would go into my car right after an IEP meeting and I would get my phone out and I would email and say, I'm requesting another IEP meeting. Has to be done within 30 days. I would do that back to back to back. And I just kind of got better and better and better. <laughs> and I sucked for a long time. Um, but just know that and be easy on yourself, okay? But just have it in your head that if it doesn't work out the first one or two times, that that's okay, all right? Um, I actually emailed, I have a couple of clients I'm working with right now, along with dealing with the due process. And um, I emailed for a client for the first time, um, just the other day, I just sent a long email. I sent an email out for her and all of a sudden the school, school did not respond. Their lawyers did. And we're talking this morning and I'm like, who is this person? You know? And she's like, it's, it's the lawyers. They're, I guess they're feeling some sort of way from your email, you know? And I was like, okay, whatever. I don't care, you know? And so I emailed back and I said, who is this? Because it was, it was with the school's logo and stuff at the bottom, but I had no idea who it was. They just simply said, please direct all your emails to me from here on forward. And I'm like, who are you? You know, because um, it wasn't specified. But I found it kind of funny that the first email I sent out, which is a first, guys, this is a first for me, um, where they immediately had their attorney on it. And typically... Um, school systems don't do that because school systems attorneys usually run in the ranges of 600 an hour. And um, so a lot of school systems don't want to just bring on their attorneys, especially over an email when they think that they can handle it. Typically they can um, on their own. So <laughs> why would an attorney jump in? Bam, just first email. So it's a little weird. But it's interesting because sometimes what you say and how you say it can be a good thing or a bad thing. And it also can make impact, all right? And that's what I try to do with my emails is I don't go for to be nasty, but I don't go for we're friends. It's straight up business and this is what the parent wants. This is what the child needs. What do we need to do to make this happen? And I'm very clear on please no longer gaslight this parent, please no longer, you know, and I, I will say, hey, stop doing this stuff. You know, let's put an end to it now. We're not putting up with that anymore. And um, schools don't like that. But then boy, do people jump on board. You got the director of special ed, you got, you know, sometimes the superintendent, they're coming into play. And, you know, so it's all about how, how you go about things and the precedents you set. So, in doing that and where you're starting, um, wherever it is you are, we're all on this journey together, but all in different places. Make sure that when you plan for next year, it's based on your child, your child's needs, and exactly that. Don't let the school dictate to you, oh, we're going to do this for next year. Let's set up an IEP meeting. And it's almost like they have this planned agenda that has nothing to do with your child's needs. And that's not how it should go. So you need to always know how to put a stop to something, even if you feel uncomfortable in the sense that you, you're going to be rude or it's going to come across rude or whatever. You cannot be thinking about that. It needs to be very clear and concise and very transparent because you have to let them know where you are and where you stand. All right? So again, you may not get what you want the first IEP, but don't get up, give up. You will get what you want. And a lot of it is just being super persistent and consistent with that. Because once you start annoying them and making complaints and letting them know that you're not playing games, that what is in the best interest of your child 
again, verbiage for education is what is needed and appropriate for your child. Um, we want what's best, but in school verbiage, you have to say what's needed and appropriate, okay? Just memorize those words. Just start saying needed and appropriate. Needed. When you want to say best, think needed and appropriate. <laughs> That's what I had to do. I had to literally like say it over and over and over because as a mom, I just always would just blurt out in an IEP meeting in my learning days, oh, I want what's best for my daughter. You guys need to do what's best for my daughter. No, they don't have to do what's best for your child, but they do have to do what's needed and appropriate. So I just take whatever it is that I think is best and stick it into the needed and appropriate category. All right, that's all you have to do. It's that simple. So you just have to kind of transfer it to that word and those words, and then that's how you deliver it in IEP meeting. All right, so simplifying it to, you know, moms and dad terms, that's really all you have to do. All right. So the next thing I want you to think about, I got you guys, I see your questions and I'm gonna get to you. I just wanna get through this first and then we're gonna talk. It's been a while, um, but I'm so glad to see you guys on here. You don't even know how excited I am. So um, the IEP team um, does not make changes if they don't make changes that you want. Um, you need to make sure that goes into parental concerns. I can't tell you how many times the parental concerns have worked for me in my own IEP meetings because you can actually go back to it and say, you know what? No, 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 no. Two years ago, I said in the parental concerns that my daughter needs X, Y, Z. Then the next year, I said it again, and I'm saying it again here. We're not doing this anymore. I've said it three years in a row. It's still a problem. We're dealing with this now. I'm not letting it go another year. All right, and so that's when you have to kind of get that umph, whatever, whatever it is you guys got to put into that meeting as nervous as you get, and I get it. I get parents who tell me all the time, I know what to say. I know what I'm going to say. I know what I'm going to do. I can tell you, Raven, or I can tell whoever, but then you get into that meeting and you freeze, you know, and that's normal because we're moms and dads and caregivers and we want what's best for our kids. And, you know, when we have that emotion, that's what makes us freeze because we don't want to screw up. And that's where you have to kind of push past that emotion, which is your worst enemy, I can promise you and try to get past that. And I know it is super hard. I still get emotional. I was just in an IEP meeting a week ago, a little less than a week ago, and I cried, all right? And I cried because I told the team, I said, I do what I do because I'm so passionate about children and about them getting what's needed and appropriate for them. And when you run into people who are like bulldozers and literally want to put a stop to everything, it's not cool and it's not okay. And I was so freaking mad that I cried. And that's the thing, guys, is it's okay to show emotion. That's okay but you don't want emotion to get so much in the way that it affects what you gotta do when you're in that meeting, okay? And it's important to understand that. People wanna know you're human, you know? And me, they want to know I'm human, at least my team or they did, you know, because I am so stickler at things, you know? And I can come across very abrasive and very forward. And I've always had the attitude of I don't care because we're not friends. We're I'm here in the best interest of my child. I want what's needed and appropriate for her. And anything else doesn't just doesn't matter to me here. It's not about um, you and it's not about me and it's not personal. And I have had to say that to teams over and over again because they're human beings, guys. So you have to understand that Sometimes taking a minute away from that IEP meeting and just having a, a heart to heart is sometimes what's needed. Now, don't get me wrong. You showing that emotion will come back and bite you in the ass. But you showing that emotion is what maybe, just maybe, is what needs to happen at that meeting. And what I mean about it possibly, more than likely, later on, biting you in the ass they're gonna use your emotion against you. That's what they do. They're not gonna use it right then and there, but they're gonna use it, all right? 
So it's kind of one of those things where you show emotion to let them know you're human, have a heart to heart because that's what's needed in that meeting at that moment. And then just know and be aware. And if it never happens, that's good. But if it does, and it sure as heck may, you need to be prepared for it. All right. And I'll talk about that at a later time. But you just need to understand that so that things don't catch you by surprise. Because when we're caught off guard and it's a surprise, then we're not prepared and ready to verbally say what we need to say. All right. So make sure that any concerns you have, I don't care if it's at two o'clock, my son needs to go to the bathroom. I don't care what it is. Whatever your concern is, as the parent, guardian, whatever you are, who's taking care of a child, I, I don't care. You know, there's so many people out there who've, you know, have, you know, our foster care and all kinds of stuff and are fighting for these kids too. So it doesn't matter. And I think it's admirable of if they aren't your children and you're fighting for them is, wow, you know. So moving forward, um, management and needs and classroom accommodations. You need to think of these things. It's not just, you know, larger text or, you know, um, giving directions, you know, maybe they need two different steps to lead to what it is that they have to do. Um, maybe it is, you know, extra time on a test, you know, all these different things. And then there's modifications where modifications is a change of which means, you know, something's changed up in that least restrictive environment if they're in a gen ed classroom. So that could be instead of extra time on a test, they could have extra time on a test for the accommodation, but then the test is actually in itself different, which is a modification. So your child can still be in the least restrictive environment. They get a different test that's possibly easier more legible to read, shorter sentences, whatever. And then the accommodation could be they still get extra time, okay? So there's a difference between the modification and accommodation, which I go through in my new course. Um, but yeah, so just know that you, you should be writing down now as you're working with your kids through COVID and, you know, things going on, is you should be writing down all the accommodations that you believe would be beneficial for your child. Now, Beneficial doesn't mean making it easy for them, okay? You want your child to work, you want your child to excel, and you want them to be pushed and to have, you know, for others in the school system to have high expectations of them. And you yourselves have high expectations of them. So don't make it to where they have accommodations that just make it babyfied for them. As the parent, make sure that you have the accommodations in play that will assist them in doing things that possibly are more difficult so that they can continue to move forward and progress, okay? Now, when you do that and you have that type of thinking of, okay, you know, my child can do this. It's going to be difficult, but they can. The school system is going to look at it as, okay, that's a lot of work. I'm not sure that that's going to happen, you know, and then they start coming up with all the excuses of why they think it should be easier because they don't want to put in that work. And sometimes it may not be a bad thing as in, you know, them trying to get out of the work, so to speak. Um, but they should be willing to do it, all right? It's it, Sometimes it can come out as they want the easy way out, and sometimes it is they want the easy way out. But you're going to have to judge that kind of by circumstance, um, and your gut is going to tell you that answer when you're in that meeting, okay? Your gut is going to tell you a lot of things when you're in that meeting, and go with that feeling. If you feel that something's up and it's total BS that someone's filling you in on, then you need to call that, okay? Don't be quiet. This is the time to not be tactful. This is the time to not shut your mouth and to actually open it and voice what is going on because you're actually speaking for another human being, all right? So if you're the type of person out there, I have tons of friends like this where they're just like, I'm not gonna say anything, that's rude. You know, I'm, I'm just gonna be quiet. You know, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. Now, we all should and hopefully live by, by that. We all screw up, but bottom line, hopefully we do that. But in an IEP meeting, guys, I'm telling you, you can't live by those rules. All the rules have to go out the window because, you know, if you have an IEP meeting always, and it is 
always tactful and respectful and they're giving your child everything that they need and um, everything's good, then you and I wouldn't be talking, you know? And sometimes I wish that was the case, you know? Not that I wasn't talking to you because I love you guys, but I just mean that I wish, you know, I, I'm not, you guys are not the only parent, I do it too, that say, why does this have to be so damn difficult? Why does it always have to be such a struggle? And even when we have those good periods of time when we can actually breathe, then something is bound to happen. You know, it's almost like we're holding our breath because we're just waiting for it to happen, you know? And that's just a really yucky feeling. And so you just always want to be on your toes and always be one step ahead of the game. And if you are, you're always going to be prepared. All right. Don't let things fall through the cracks. Like, don't be like that. All right. Be you and and be able to know that even in those good times is when you actually need to be more aware of everything in writing, you know, videotape things. Stay with those rules that I teach you guys, because that is the time that it's going to be used and abused the most. All right. It's kind of like, you know, that sneaky way, you know, have you ever heard, you know, where it's the quiet person you have to watch out for, (laughs) not the person that talks all the time. You know, it's one of those things, you know, where when things are going smooth, it's like, okay, what's up? What's going on? You know, Um, and that's the time actually to to be going into the school and observing your child like what's going on that everything is so quiet and you know everything's so good that doesn't mean we want something bad to happen but I feel that just in my experience that when you at least are prepared and your head is in the game even if it is at perfection at least you're on your toes and ready to go if ever need be okay um The next thing I want you to think about in your plan for next year, other than what you guys should be doing, which is recording your children right now still, you should be emailing your team every week and you should be taking your notes. This is your data, all right? If there's behavior issues, if there's, you know, struggle, if there's, you know, regression, whatever it is, you need to be catching that on video, okay? Um, So the behavior intervention plan. So if your child has behaviors, All right. And a lot of people think that a behavior intervention plan should be done after an FBA um, is for a child that is bad. Okay, well, that's not true. Um, Children don't have to be bad. And most children are not bad. They just don't know how to act or control themselves in a certain circumstance or their disability is impacted so severely that it can't be helped, etc. However, A behavior intervention plan can be established and created over simple things like a child likes to suck on something, whether it be their fingers or a pencil or a pen. All right. That is a behavior that is not appropriate in the educational setting. All right. Or a child that takes paper and crinkles it all up. All right. And is is frustrated and they crinkle up all their paper. And that's the only behavior they have. That is a behavior. All right. So behaviors that are not appropriate in the least restrictive environment or really any environment, it is one that can have a BIP, even for one thing. All right. Now, can other things be put in place before a BIP is put in place for one or two or three different behaviors? Of course, but typically they don't work, all right? And a BIP is necessary because it works on the ABCs, all right? And so um, so if you know what a BIP is made for, you know, the antecedent, the behavior, and um, moving forward of how to resolve that behavior in a positive way and teaching that child other ways in which to um, take that initiative in changing that behavior, giving them other ideas dependent on their age is what's provided to them as a positive to replace that behavior. Really, it's trying to replace that behavior with something positive. All right. So the next thing you want to look at is, does my child need an FBA? All right. Even if it's something that you think is a possibility, 
get the FBA and see. All right. Make sure though that a uh, behavior analyst does your B behavior plan and your FBA. Okay. That's important. A lot of psychologists will do that. Not ideal. That's not really their specialty. Um, a behavior analyst, which is a board certified behavior analyst, BCBA, um, that's what they do is behavior. And that's the person who is the expert in that area. And that's the argument you have to argue is that is their specialty. That is what they do. The psychologist, that is not what they do. They take data, sure. They talk to students, they do, you know, psychological examinations, et cetera, et cetera. A behavior analyst doesn't do a psychological examination. They do behavior. And so you want a behaviorist doing your FBA. All right. Um, make sure that if your child has a BIP going into the following year, that you always have an updated FBA so that you can tweak and play with that BIP. All right. And make sure that you, um, you, you stay on top of that BIP and that it's working effectively. Ask for graphical data. All right. Because with behavior, when you see data going up and down, what spikes that behavior? What decreases it? When does it decrease? So, for example, um, my daughter's data will show like on Mondays, sometimes it's increased because she's been home over the weekend. Then it goes drastically down Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. All right. And then goes back up on Monday and sometimes is a little bit higher on Tuesday and then goes back down Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So and things, you know, they realized and did had to put things in place to decrease things on Monday and Tuesday. All right. So make sure that your BIP is in place. Make sure you stay um, in tune with what it means and ask questions and ask the BCBA what that is and what it means and what they're doing and then request and put into the IEP that you want graphical data along with being updated weekly or however it is not progress report time too much time for behavior you want something in play on a weekly basis a daily communication sheet you can go to my um, education vault for that but make sure that you're in tune with behavior, okay? So the next thing, you wanna think about your child's classes and how that's gonna look. Now going into next year, that could be different, but you still need to think about that. And you also need to think about if it's gonna be online, okay? So that is part of what you're gonna be thinking about right now and thinking about what's that gonna look like for your child going into next year. Or if your child does go to school, this six feet apart thing, and actually schools are actually doing a 10 feet sometimes in some areas. So you need to, what does that look like in a classroom? I mean, how many kids can be in that classroom if that's the case? And then they're talking about, you know, um, allowing so many kids in at one time and then other kids in after that. And, you know, it just seems like a big cluster, you know what mess to me. Um, and I don't think it's going to be very easy. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult for a lot of us. And I think it's going to be difficult more so for the children. And that's not just children with special needs. That's all children. And um, I think that you need to focus on thinking now about these things so that you have your plan of action. You have your data that you're taking right now. And you have your case set forth before you so that you can then proceed in the right way um, and if you have to fight for speech OT whatever it is even though that's super difficult to do online if you feel that it's still necessary or that your child can benefit from it online then you need to be prepared to do that and that's what your data is all about all right another thing in looking at classes you need to look at does your child need a smaller class is your child okay in a larger class or you need to look at um is there certain um people that needs to be in that class for example there's not a lot of classes these days that always have a paraprofessional in that class to help and support or you know you have to look at those things and not all classes are going to have that so you just want to make sure that you're you're staying in tune with what's going on and please do what I call the hunt and gather. And that is going into your child's school and hunting the information down by observing. All right, being quiet and just observing. You leave, you digest, you write everything down, 
don't go to an email and start emailing right away. You know, I give out a sheet to all my course people and I, you know, write on this every day. And when you're in the shower and you're thinking of all those questions or things that come up or you just observed your child and then the next morning you take a shower and you're thinking of all these different things, us moms do that, dads, all right? So if y'all don't do it, we do it, all right? And um, you just, I mean, I know I do a lot of my best thinking when I'm driving a long drive, you know? Um, and in the shower too. <laughs> I talk to myself in the shower. <laughs> so, I mean, I do a lot of thinking. My brain's always moving. And so you want something, you know, like a journal or a um, daily sheet to be able to write down all your thoughts. Because once you have things put in on paper, you're able to put it together. And believe it or not, after a week, if you look down at everything that you wrote, you basically will have a story there, a story of things that you've thought about, of things that are important, and then you're able to put it together into an email format. So it's something that will um, stand out to you even more once you start doing it. All right, so related services, all right? So think about what related services will my child need next year? Things have changed. My child's been out of school for six months. Is there something new? Um, is there something that, you know, needs to be increased because it's no longer working? All right. One of the things that I teach in my mini course that's coming out, and I'll go over this really quick with you, is you want to always ask yourself how often, how long, one or one or in a group and where. All right. So if you want to write that down, I'll tell you again. How often, how long, one or one on one or in a group and where, all right? When it comes to related services, how often, how long, one-on-one -on -one, or in a group and where, okay? So that is the most important thing to remember, all right? So the next thing I want you guys to look at, and this is huge in California, um, is transportation. Um, transportation, <laughs> It's not offered for some reason um, to a lot of kids in California. I don't know if that's any other state. Please post below if it is. And if you're just jumping on, just so you know, please post a one below. If you're new to catching me live, post a two below if you're an oldie but goodie, okay? And if you're catching the replay, welcome. I'm so happy to have you. Um, make sure you click notifications and join the group at Autism Mama Rocks IEP group. You can stick that in the search bar. All right, so going back to transportation, guys. Um, you want to make sure that your child gets transportation unless you want to take them to school and pick them up, which is just fine. Um, but the fact that transportation, especially in California, from a lot of the um, cases that I've done there, um, they're refusing transportation. Like parents are having to fight for transportation. <laughs> That's insane. And, you know, they're making it about... Um, different rules when idea did not change because you live in California and it's not a state based thing. Transportation is part of idea and a state does not get to dictate the provision of this service that is given to a child who has a disability. All right. So just make sure of that. And then if your kid is on in transportation, has transportation, you need to look at, you know, is it a special education bus? Is it a mini bus with an attendant? Is it um, a private um, person who picks up a private transportation? Okay. Um, is there a nurse on the bus? Is there a paraprofessional on the bus? There's different ways in which to transport your kids and dependent on their impact of disability. All right. So the last thing I'm going to talk about before moving forward, we have more to talk about come this week. I have all my notes all written out. I did do that while I was in Florida, guys. I did do that, all right? But you got to understand, this due process stuff, it's a lot of work. Um, so the last thing is testing accommodations. And what you want to look at there is, it, is, does the test need to, can it stay the same? Or does it need to be modified? All right, and if it needs to be modified, how does it need to be modified? What needs changed? All right. Um, the other thing you want to look at is um, can they be in a regular education classroom, gen ed classroom for the test or do they need to go to a more restrictive environment for test taking only? 
okay? Um, does the test need to be read to them? Does it not need to be read to them? Do, um, does the child need to be taken to a quiet place to take that test? You know, so there's different testing accommodations. Um, there is no limit to um, accommodations and modifications, okay? So just like the IEP, I always tell people, just like the IEP, your accommodations and modifications, they're, they're limitless. There is no provision, there is no stopping point, there is no, we can't do that or this or the other because IDEA did not put that in play. They actually left it open because it's based off the child's needs and what is needed for them and appropriate for them, not just, you know, a one size fits all, which is, is a big thing in school systems. Um, <clears throat> so it's a big deal and I want you guys to be aware of that. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. I am done for the day. Um, so hopefully you got a lot out of today. Um, and understand that, you know, my topic, which was the IEP is like a burrito, but then you open it up and it's a big mess, you know, and, but it's so yummy, right? But um, the thing is, is that's exactly how an IEP is. The IEP can actually be yummy, guys. It can be good. It can look good. It can taste good in the sense of, you know, how it makes you feel, you know, um, but you got to work for it and you got to, you know, understand the provisions in which things play out and understand that it's a political arena. And, you know, one example I'll tell you about is when I was in Florida, I actually had an IEP meeting and it was the one that I was so frustrated and angry at. And um, I was so frustrated because the the guardian, which was the grandmother, um, was requesting things and they, the director of special ed actually said, well, we don't typically do things like that. What? You don't typically do things like that. Now hear me out here. Now, if you were in an IEP meeting and, you know, a lot of parents that I'm in IEP meetings with, they don't pick up on certain wording that will throw me through a loop, you know, and... So I stop, I stop everybody. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what did you just say? Can you repeat that please? And then she said, well, we don't typically do things like that. And I said, I don't care. You don't have to typically do it. You need to do it this time though. Uh, what do you mean you don't typically do it? I don't care what you typically do. We're talking about individual children. And she said, well, we'll have to talk about that later on in the IEP because we don't typically do it like that. Okay, I said, well, this time you're going to do it like that because it doesn't matter what you typically do because what you typically do isn't pertaining to this child. And this child is who we're talking about. I don't care what you typically do or did last year. I care about what you're doing now for this child and what's needed and appropriate for him now. Okay? And then she says, well, you know, I don't, I don't like your tone. <laughs> Okay, um, so we move forward and, you know, the meeting in my mind was not as productive as I would have wanted it. And there's another meeting coming up. And um, what I want you to know about this is don't let those words slide. Do not. Typically is basically saying, we don't typically do that, but we don't do it because we like the one size fits all. We like things that make us feel comfortable. We like things that are easy for us and we don't have to think about. We like things that, you know, we don't have to work hard for. We like things that, you know, isn't going to make your child progress because we just want to keep things easy and everybody happy and you guys not down our back, meaning the parents down their back. And, you know, that's a typical situation for a school system. Well, do you want it typical? Do you want it the norm? Do you want it what they normally do and don't want to deviate? Or do you want something that is going to produce something good, progress, that is going to produce your child to grow, to close the gap? If there is a gap there, if your child's in second grade or third grade and they're reading on like a kindergarten level or if they're in fifth grade and reading on a first grade level, whatever it is, 
closing the gap is important. So pushing the child and, you know, encouraging the child and giving that child every support, accommodation, and modification that they need so that they can continue to progress and that gap get closed as best as possible versus a school system stating to you that, oh, well, we don't typically do it like that. Don't accept that. Don't let it bypass. Don't let it go in the IEP meeting. Don't let it go undetected and make sure that you address it right then and there. Don't let them say things in your IEP meeting like, oh, well, we'll talk about that when we get to accommodations. Because me, I go through every single page of the IEP when I am in an IEP. We don't skip pages. We, we go start at page one. And um, that's how you don't miss something. And a lot of times they'll want to keep moving and keep moving. Oh, we need to keep this moving forward. We need to keep this moving forward. We, we'll, we'll talk about the, the services. We'll talk about that in the accommodations. Nope. I want to talk about it right now. And that's what you need to say. There is no spot in the IEP meeting that says, okay, Raven can talk now. And then on page four, Raven can't talk. But then on page six, Raven can talk again doesn't work like that. So don't let them say, no, 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 we'll talk about that down here. <laughs> no, you say that. Say, no, 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 no. I'm going to talk when I need to talk. I'm the parent. I'm a part of the team just like you. So I'm going to talk when I feel I need to because I need to make sure that my child's needs are met. And you just make sure that you keep telling them that. You're going to have to say this till you're blue in the face. You're going to have to keep saying, no, 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 no. That's not how it's going to work. I'm part of the team just like you. Say that first because then they're, they can't argue that, all right? And if they ever make you not part of the team, that's a procedural violation. That's a um, procedural violation in reference to FAPE, okay? So if they ever say, no, 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 <laughs> you can't do that, then you say, well, that makes me feel like I'm not part of the team. I'm not able to contribute as part of the team. Is that what you're saying? Say that to them and see what they say. They're going to backtrack real quick real quick. And then if you say, oh, okay, if that's what you're saying, then we both understand. And just for the record, say that, just for the record, I just want you to know that that's a procedural safeguard and not providing faith. See what they say then. All right. So you guys take that, digest it. All right. Remember that your data that you're taking now is going to be everything you possibly need for next year. And then it's all in what I call what? The PPPN. Plan and prepare, present, persuade, and negotiate. All right. So you guys have a wonderful evening. I'm going to now talk to you guys and answer some questions. So again, post a one below, below if you're new and you haven't seen me live before, or maybe it's your first or second time, and post a two below if you're an oldie but goodie. Okay? All right, guys. So Tina says, I made another live. Yes, you did. Um, Tony is a two. Yes, you are, girl. <laughs> and Cynthia, hello, hello. You'll have to share your awesome news. Um, Tina says, that's how I knew I have my notifications on. Yes. So everybody click your notifications so you know when I go live. Um, then Tina's saying she needs it. Um, I had my IEP Friday and from the start they told me needed to be quick and they had a meeting to go to. Oh, well, the, you stop that meeting right then and there if they say that. That will piss me off to no end. And that's why it's so important before the IEP meeting you tell them, number one, plan on recording. Number two, especially if you're a two-party state. Number two, Please plan on a three-hour IEP. Well, if, it, if I'm involved, it has to be a three-hour IEP meeting. You guys decide what you want it to be. But a, an IEP should never be less than a two-hour. Never. All right? So you prep them ahead of time, and you need to do that 10 days in advance, 10 business days in advance of the IEP meeting. You need to state what it, your expectations are. This is the things that I'm going to be going through, you know? Or you can say you need to just leave three hours if you don't want to let them know what you're going to be going through because you don't want to some things you don't want to prepare them for for them to come have a quick answer for you <laughs> sometimes you want to 
not have them prepared, you present in the right way to persuade them, and they did not have time to think other than to do the right thing, okay? All right, so Tara says hi. Um, Roxy says you rock, thank you. Um, Vanessa says you rock, thank you. Um, Tony says my district does it. What were you referring to? I've, I talked a lot today, so <laughs> tell, me, tell me what I was talking about. Um, Tony says they refuse to meet with the advocate without the attorney. Um, that's actually not allowed unless it's a legal proceeding. So for example, or unless you allowed it. But so for example, an advocate can go to a mediation with a client, um, whether it, it could be a mediation or it can be a mediation to progress and go on and move on to due process. Uh, advocate can be there. And then in almost all states, it's like, like four, I think, four or six advocates can represent in a due process, okay, which is what I'm doing now. Um, but an attorney can actually, in fact, not be present at mediation, okay? All right. So Cynthia says, have you dealt with the school system before? What school system? Um, maybe you know, maybe they know looking for at the educators here, which ones, which ones got Ravens? Oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> um, Christina says, hi, hi lady. How are you? Um, what about during summer? We had just our annual, now they're on summer break. I asked to address the need for ESY and they didn't in the meeting. Well, they should have in the meeting. That's where ESY is discussed. So discussing ESY in the meeting is where it's supposed to be done. Now I've had recently, um, I think I told you guys, California has blown my mind in the things that they will tell you. I, I cannot put anything past California now. Um, but they have literally said in an IEP meeting, along with New York, um, oh, well, we don't talk about ESY in IEP meetings. And I said, where do you talk about them? Do you like meet for dinner or am I missing something? I don't understand. Well, we, we're just not talking about ESY in this IEP meeting. I said, oh, 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 okay. I understand. So what you're saying is, all right, I'm mirroring them. What you're saying is, ESY is, is talked about in, in IEP meetings, but it's not going to be talked about in this meeting. Am I understanding you right? Do you see what I'm doing now? Is I'm changing up how they just said that to me. I'm saying, no, it is done in an IEP meeting because where else would it be done? What type of meeting? There's no such thing as an ESY meeting. So... You're saying that you're refusing, and I'll say that too, you are refusing to speak about ESY in this IEP meeting. Is that correct? Because in IDEA, okay, and in the IEP, it states that we should be talking about ESY at each and every IEP meeting. So please clarify for me your refusal of not discussing ESY at this meeting. That's what you need to say, all right? All right, um, Christina says, so passionate about this, I cry when I'm mad too. Yeah. Um, Jess says, I just print out your checklist. Oh, cool. I love my checklist. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So if anybody wants my checklist, it's free. Um, check it out. Um, Cynthia says, how dealt how detailed does an IEP need to be if thinking about our district's new virtual school? Superintendent said that it must be equitable and the EC student will still get EC services. Yeah, um, everything has to stay the same other than the physical. Um, I actually am not a fan of changing your IEP to say virtual. Because as long as your IEP has what needs to be in there, it doesn't need to say virtual, okay? So be careful changing things like that. 
because if it's supposed to be given in school, if the only thing offered is virtual, they have to do that. They have to provide everything in the IEP. And obviously no kids are going to school, so it has to be virtual. So that doesn't need to be in your IEP, okay? Just be careful changing little things like that. Don't let them convince you of that. As long as it's in, if you have an accommodation in your IEP or you have a service in your IEP and school is in session and they're, all kids are getting, you know, education virtually, then your child will get whatever is in that IEP, even if it's said to be in the educational setting, because obviously that's not the case at the moment. Um, Kim says, I just want to say you're amazing. I just found you within the last couple weeks. Thank you so much for helping and sharing your knowledge with us. You're so welcome. Thank you. Um, she says, Kim's continuing to say, you're right. They take an easy way out of what a child should be offered. My son was not given what he should have. Um, I just found out at the last IEP, things were not being done. When I stepped up for the next year, they were making excuses. I get it. Um, Tara says, I pulled a raven a few days ago. <laughs> What's a raven? <laughs> that sounds funny. Yeah. Um, I'm like, hmm, was that a good one or a bad one? <laughs> I'm curious. Um, when a teacher made my son take off his gloves and shoe necklace that were that he wears all the time, he hid under his desk for the rest of the day. So when I found out, I was not happy at all. Okay, so I can see which way that went. <laughs> um, Cynthia says, our school system said by our state guidelines that only seven to 10 students per bus. Yes. I mean, I don't even, next year's just gonna be hard, guys. But you wanna get your IEPs straight because it's gonna get harder and harder. And you, you wanna, you know, that's what a lot of my clients are doing right now is we're emailing, emailing, and we're setting up all those dates so that, um, they're all set up. And even um, with evaluations, I'm stating that they'll they'll start the evaluations within the first 15 days of school starting, whether that be virtually or in school. So um, yeah. So Kim, welcome. I'm glad you're number one, but you're not going to be for long. Um, Jess says we get it in Georgia. Yes. Um, Linda, hello, hello. You are not new anymore, girl. <laughs> um, so we have Christina and Castillo. Is it Castillo or Castillo? Welcome. Um, first time. So welcome that you are here. That's awesome. And Deborah, welcome, welcome. So happy to have you too. Make sure you guys say hello and tell us about yourselves. And if you haven't joined the group, make sure you do that. Um, Logie, is it Logie? Um, Anna, hey lady, how are you? Um, then we have Castillo says, very informative, thank you. You're welcome. And then Tony says, they did it. Um, gotta run, have a great night. All right, girl, I'll talk to you soon. Um, Jess says, ESY, what is that again? It's, um, it's basically extended school year, so through the summer. Um, Emmett says, how long do a person have to look over the IEP before the school finalizes? it? Well, you can sign it at the meeting, which I highly do not advise. Um, but um, I, I suggest you go through it in detail and make sure you agree to each and every word. Um, and then you would sign it. But if you don't agree to even a little bit in it, you don't want to sign it. Now you can say, I agree to X, Y, Z, but I don't agree to this. You are more than welcome to implement X, Y, Z that I agree with. However, this is what I don't agree with and it is not approved to be implemented and a new IEP needs to be rescheduled. So I typically will not sign an IEP, even if I don't agree with just one thing, but some people will feel comfortable um, signing an IEP, but specifying what they don't agree with. Um, Christina says extended school. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jan said the same thing. Um, 
Then Emmett says, can you have an easy, an easy put in your IEP plan and decide not to do it? I don't know what that means, so I need you to clarify. Um, Kim says, what should you do if you find out that your child's IEP is not being followed? Um, like going to gen ed when they're supposed to, can you call another meeting or send emails? Um, I found out that he wasn't doing what he should have for a good three months. Um, I used to be nice. Um, I don't remember those days anymore. Um, and I'm not being a smart ass. I'm not. Um, no, I just don't have patience or tolerance anymore with as long as I've done this and as many children I've seen just swept under the rug. Um, there's no reason for a school system to not implement what is inside a child's IEP. I used to give chances. I used to talk with the school. I used to email them. I used to warn them of, you know, this isn't happening, blah, blah, blah. I don't even advise that anymore. And I'll tell you why. I believe that it's a legal document. I was nice for a hot minute. Actually, I was nice for several years. Um, six and a half to be exact, if you guys know my story. I have no tolerance anymore. I don't at all. And the reason I don't is because these are adults. They're supposed to be providing a service, an education, an individual education to our children. And so many children, on top of that, so many children with special needs are swept under the rug or just slide by and it shouldn't be like that. All right. So if you know for a fact that your child has not, their IEP has not been implemented as it is written is what it's called, then that's what you make a state complaint on and back it up with the proof that you have. So it can't be, I heard, it has to be, you got to have it in an email. Sometimes I will make it to where I get the information given to me, you know? So find out, ask questions and get the, make sure you get your information. They have to provide it. Now, whether they lie or not, who knows, but they have to provide you the answers to your questions. Okay. So, um. If you have the proof, I say make a complaint. The complaint is my child's IEP was not implemented as it is written. The school system disregarded my child's IEP and did not follow it how it is written. Okay. And then you provide your proof. Okay. Um, Deborah said hi from Santa Rosa, California. Um, Santa Rosa City Schools, it is a hard bone to get services. Um, I was just saying this earlier, Deborah, California is a nightmare. I have been to several IEPs there in the last month and they will take every bit of patience out of me. It's a lot of work in California. I mean, they just don't, they think that they, they just make their own rules, really, um, and think that that's how things are gonna fly. Um, yeah, you'll have to fill me in. Um, so Emmett Ham says, I meant can a person have ESY put into the IEP and not do it in the summer? No, you cannot. Um, ESY is extended school year, yes, it can be any time of the year, but you would have to get them to agree. Typically they offer it in the summer. No, um, ESY can be given um, in the other areas, which are like spring break or Christmas break, but it is not likely. It is typically not gonna happen. So typically ESY is given in the summer. I mean, the only other time is Christmas break and spring break and I can pretty much guarantee that they're not going to do that because they're going to have, what's going to have to happen is they're going to have to find a teacher that's willing 
to give up her spring break and Christmas break to provide services for your child, which they're not required to do during that time. So um, can it happen? Sure. Will it happen? More likely not. Just keeping it real. Um, Cynthia says, oh, how does a school keep up with days EC services are given? I'm only seeing data from Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday every other week. Um, are you talking about like services as far as like speech, OT, PT? Um, Deborah says, my kids need special services. One has an IEP and the older doesn't qualify. So they offer me a 504, but they don't follow the plan and the teachers are not trained to teach him. They say he is very smart and he doesn't need an IEP. Um, yeah. And you're in California. Um, go ahead and PM me, Deborah, and we'll talk. We'll set up a time to talk, okay? Because that's how California is rolling, unfortunately. Okay? So um, message me and we'll talk. Um, all right. I guess that's it, guys. It was good being on here. Oh, my gosh. It's been great. So... Um, message me if you guys need anything and I will be on live again, um, tomorrow. And what does it say? All right. I'm starting to think Tuesday and Friday are IEP days. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So services, if you think that services aren't being given to your child, you know, again, you have to have proof. Um, but if you have proof, um, then services and accommodations and modifications can actually be a state complaint and it can also be an OCR complaint. So dependent on what it is and what you got as far as objective data for it, um, yeah, it can be an either or complaint dependent on what the story is. Yeah, I'm glad I'm back too, Anna. <laughs> and we'll talk soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to be going away again when for the due process, which will be, I don't know, four to six weeks. We'll know probably next. later on this week. We'll know. Thank you for your help and information. After finding out some stuff this year, I'm going to step it up. <laughs> I know you got this, Kim. Message me if you need anything, though, okay? Um, and I will talk to you guys soon. I will be on again tomorrow. I may be on my group tomorrow. So if you guys want to catch me, then join the group if you haven't already. Just stick in, in the search bar. Autism Mama Rocks the IEP group, okay? I will talk to you guys soon. Take care.